Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. To my bed crimers, hi, how are you? I hope you're doing well. To anyone new here, a warm welcome. Thank you for checking out the channel. Let me just ask that after listening to and or watching the video, if you found you enjoyed it, please do me a favor, smash that like button. And if you want to support the work I do, please consider a Patreon membership. You'll find a link in the description. Now, let's dig in. The Idaho student murders case out of Moscow, Idaho has generated pretty much more speculation and more conspiracy theories than any other case, except maybe the Jean Benet Ramsey case. Here's one about the case in Idaho that saw four beautiful young kids, Ethan Chapin, Zana Cornodo, Kaylee Gonsalves, and Madison Mogan slaughtered in the sanctity of their rental home that I hadn't heard before. Some of you may have heard this theory. Ethan Chapin's mother, Stacy, attended CrimeCon in Orlando last month as a guest. While there, Stacy met with journalists and she signed copies of a children's book she wrote about her son called The Boy Who Wore Blue. Stacy was shadowed by a reporter from the New York Times who wrote an article about her after the conference. The article is entitled The Nation's Obsession with True Crime Meets a Mother's Grief. Stacy, not a follower of true crime, but rather thrust into it because of her real life tragedy, attended CrimeCon to try and help people remember the four lives that were lost. She wasn't there to indulge in true crime sessions. She also wanted to connect with other victim families who were looking to find community and build support for a foundation that will award college scholarships in her son's honor. And at a meeting of family members of crime victims, she met relatives of Gabby Petito, who, as you all probably know, was done in by her fiance, Brian Laundry in 2021 during a cross country road trip. Stacy also briefly watched a session with more than 3,000 participants where the crime that took her son's life was discussed. The session was by college professor of forensics, Joseph Scott Morgan, and he was conducting a forensic analysis of how Ethan and his three friends had been brutally done in on November 13th of 2022. Stacy backed herself into an alcove to observe the discussion. Apparently, Morgan mispronounced Ethan's girlfriend's name, Zena Cornodo, and got a fact wrong about the case. The mistake had something to do with his description of the landscape around the crime scene. I think by landscape, it means how the bodies were found inside the crime scene house. The audience was apparently mesmerized, but within minutes, Stacy exited the room. Once out in the hallway, she whispered, why does that person get to talk about my kid in front of all those people? Should I go up on the stage? Stacy was frustrated, as any parent in this situation would have been. Stacy then sought refuge in a private lounge where she came upon CrimeCon's founder, Kevin Belf. She told Kevin how unnerving it was to hear someone she didn't know and who lacked a full knowledge of the case's details talk about the crime to such a large audience. She told Kevin, quote, there are so many people in there. It's shocking. Kevin told Chapin, quote, I wish I had called you and said, don't go in there. End quote. Kevin had carefully chosen Joseph Scott Morgan for the session because he was someone he trusted not to indulge in sensationalism. So Stacy, who was still upset at this point, decided to go back into the large room. And when she got in there, she got in line for the microphone. She's a brave lady. And she waited to talk to Joseph Scott Morgan. When it was her turn, she spoke briefly. Her voice was shaking and she said she wanted the crowd to know that all the positive things that they heard about the victims were true. She also said, quote, don't forget these kids. 
They were amazing, amazing kids in the prime of their life, end quote. If someone's going to talk about this crime, especially if one of the victim's parents is in the audience, they need to do so with extreme care and professionalism. But I can't imagine Joseph Scott Morgan doing anything to hurt a victim's family, at least not deliberately. But again, he's only human, so it's possible he made the mistakes that upset Stacy Chapin. It goes to show that even the most trusted experts make mistakes occasionally. It's very unfortunate that Stacy was there when it happened. She also told the New York Times reporter of her fury upon learning that some people were speculating at some point that her son Ethan might have carried out the crime as part of a murder unaliving plan. Had you guys heard that? I never heard that theory. Clearly, you can understand why that would hurt her. And now apparently another parent is angry, a parent of one of the victims. This time, it's about the most recent installment about the case that was in airmail news. Haley's father, Steve Gonsalves, is angry that the writer, Howard Bloom, talked about the surviving roommates being awake and communicating with each other on the night of the crime. The revelation from the airmail story is attributed to grand jurors on the case who allegedly leaked the information to Kaylee's father, although apparently Howard Bloom concedes that neither Mr. Gonsalves nor his attorney Shannon Gray agreed to comment. Mr. Gonsalves said this about Howard Bloom and the article. This is nothing more than grandstanding and a very, very poor attempt at getting attention. This piece is obviously fictional, but written in poor taste, end quote. It's kind of a confusing quote because he's saying it's obviously fictional, and then he says, but written in poor taste. So Mr. Gonsalves is saying flat out that we cannot trust journalist Howard Bloom's multi-part series on the case. Me, being upset about hearing this, I decided to contact Airmail, see if Howard Bloom fact-checked his article, or if someone else at the magazine fact-checked it before publication. That is the normal protocol. I know because I was a senior editor at a magazine before starting my podcast. I'm wondering if Steve Gonsalves shared this information with Howard Bloom, but asked him not to publish it. Is that a possibility? I'm sick of information being shared through articles in what I thought were trustworthy publications and in TV shows as well that I believed did their due diligence, like Keith Morrison, who did a show and stated that suspect Brian Koberger did in fact purchase a K-bar before moving from Pennsylvania to Washington State for school. When Bloom mentioned there being a receipt for the K-Bar and it getting lost, I felt that this was the second time we heard about Koberger allegedly purchasing that weapon. To me, this was verification that both Keith Morrison and Howard Bloom saw evidence or documentation or were told by trusted sources that Koberger bought the K-Bar. So I've reached out to both Dateline and Airmail Magazine. I want to see if they can verify that these authors saw proof or that they were told by a trusted source that Koberger indeed purchased a K-Bar off of Amazon. Let you know if and when I hear back from either Airmail, Dateline, or both. I don't know if we should believe these two prominent entities, Airmail and Dateline, or if we should believe Mr. Gonsalves on this. Misinformation from Airmail News, Dateline, or Mr. Gonsalves, in my mind, would be hurtful to this case in the long run. No one should be either making stuff up, as Mr. Gonsalves said it was fictionalized, or saying that something that is factual is fiction. Both of those scenarios scenarios undermine the case. Of course, some of the tactics that defense lawyers use to create reasonable doubt during trials can sometimes smack of fiction, too. But I thought justice is supposed to be about truth. Let's hope the truth, and nothing but the truth, is what the victim's families ultimately get, as well as the jurors, if this case makes it to trial. 
In other news about this case, Judge John Judge has denied a request from Koberger's defense team to pause the case against him. Judge Judge denied the motion, saying it was too premature. Koberger's lawyers filed the motion in a move to try and get the grand jury's indictment against their client dismissed. They argued for dismissal because they said only 32 jurors were brought in to hear the case rather than 45 jurors. The judge said that this does not constitute a substantial failure to comply with grand jury procedures. Thus, he denied the motion. And now, Koberger's team has 37 days in which to review the evidence and decide if they want to renew the motion to pause the proceedings that are moving Koberger toward trial. Now, when I looked up grand jury rules in Idaho, it said that grand juries typically are made up of 16 jurors. 16. I'm thinking the 32 grand jurors were selected maybe as backup. 16 to sit in on the proceedings and 16 to serve as backup. I'm not sure why Koberger's lawyers feel that 45 grand jurors should have been selected. I've written to attorney Lori Hellis, who's writing a book about the Lori Vallow case in Idaho, to see if she can help clarify this. I'll let you know as soon as I hear back, if I hear back, Lori Hellis is hella busy right now writing her book, but she's been very kind in the past when it comes to answering legal questions for me. That's all for the Idaho student case today. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories.